Hi guys, this is Mick from Cyphertown.com again, and uh, just want to share with you another refinement you can do to your Method 2 rules, which will govern the way your numbers work, your rotational numbers will work within your cipher. Um, this is a follow-up on the first video I did for Method 2, so if you don't know what I'm talking about, you should probably look at that one, even though that's a rather lengthy video at 48 minutes, it will get you up to speed with what I'm talking about here. But one of the concerns with just using the face value of these numbers is that uh, if they find the entry, the combination, uh, you know, where the, your key is set up on which letter, uh, and they start to decode and if you have a straightforward method, perhaps you're just going always clockwise or something like that and using real values, um, not exactly the most secure type of cipher. So this is a very easy rule you can apply. Uh, in the previous video, uh, when I show you the more advanced method, I am using uh, a series of different approaches to rules that will define what these numbers can mean. but Right here, uh, we have a very simple yet uh, elegant solution to the problem of the numbers. And what we do here is simply assign them to different values based on occurrence. And by occurrence, I mean when you go along and you make your cipher, you are injecting these numbers in, these numbers which are rotational commands. And usually, you know, three means a three, you rotate three to the right, or maybe you have a rule that says rotate three to the left, but whichever. Uh, and now, if you got, let's for example, a, a 2, uh, and you've already had a 2, you would go to the second occurrence, and well, in this case, a 2 is a 2, but if you went to the third occurrence, a 2 would be a 3, or if it was the first occurrence, a 2 would be a 1, as far as how far you would rotate that inner disk, the mobilisk. Now, uh, you may be wondering how I'm getting these numbers, am, am I just pulling them out of my head? Uh, no, I uh, don't like to do that. Uh, what I have here is these, uh, well, they're actually D5 dice that are made out of a 10-sided conical polygon here. And uh, these work very well. So I have six of these, which I'll put in my, my hand right here. And uh, what I'll do is I'll just randomly put them in the tray here, rotate them around, and see what we get. Now I'm going to read from left to right. So looking, you can see I have a 2, 2, 5, 2, 5, and that's a 4. So we can write this down for number 3. So uh, 2, 2, 2, I'm sorry, it's 2, 2, and then the closest one line would be a 5. So 2, 2, 5, 2, 5, one, 4. Okay, so there we go. And we have one more row to go, so we'll grab them again and uh, shake them off off screen here and throw them in and see what we get. Now we have a 1, 3, Five four one five. So let's put that on number four. One three five four one five. Okay, so now we have our new set of rules for the functioning of the four rotational numbers. Now, by using dice you tend to avoid doing very human things like um, this particular row here with a lot of twos. You would go, mm, I don't want that many twos. You would make those decisions. Maybe the same thing up here with the fours. But it is exactly that type of randomness that makes it uh, more difficult to break code because it's illogical and it lacks order and it lacks total um, utilization of numbers that are available. Those types of things are things that humans kind of inject into 
codes when they're making them. And by using true randomness via the dice here, um, you kind of eliminate that. You kind of make something that's a bit, bit more crazy as it was, a bit more like chaos. Uh, incidentally, I'm getting these dice from this really great little company called G2 Collectibles and Hobbies. Um, they're located in Worthington, Ohio, and uh, I have a link to them in the description of this video below. But it's very easy to get to. It's just www.g2ch.com. And uh, this guy, uh, his name's Steve, he's got some really great dice for all sorts of utilizations and all sorts of uses uh, on many, many different types of dice. And uh, it's just uh, really cool to uh, use these when we're working with ciphers because it gives us a... Uh, uh, a level of randomness that you just can't get anywhere else. And it also makes uh, creating your cipher uh, a lot more fun. Uh, so uh, that's a good source for dice that will help you in your cipher creations. So you can implement this as a rule. You can make another one of these very quickly and you can implement them as another rule via codebook. You know, like you could have, you know, CB, you know, 22, and they would look up CB 22 and it would say, okay, for these occurrences, for your numbers, go here, okay? So this is a very interesting way. It's a very simple way. And uh, I'm going to show you in another video a progression of this, which is kind of uh, super secure. Uh, but even as it is now, this really changes the security level of your Alberti cipher encryptions if you simply use this rule or even better multiple versions of this rule kicked in by uh, a codebook entry. Alrighty well thanks for watching and I hope you're having fun with your Alberti cipher. Uh, they are available from Creative Craft House and uh, there is a link also in the description below so you can order one if you're interested. Okay, thanks for watching and bye for now.